Well, I have 10 o'clock. We will uh, we'll go by Steve's Eastern Standard Time. We'll call the meeting to order. And uh, the first thing is the uh, governor of the state of Minnesota has issued executive order 20-01 declaring a peacetime emergency and coordinating Minnesota's uh, strategy to protect Minnesotans from COVID-19. On March 24, 2020, Pine County Board of Commissioners declared a local emergency for Pine County. Based on these conditions, the chair of the Pine County Board of Commissioners has determined that the requirements of statute 13D.021 subdivision one have been met and it is not practical or prudent for members of the county board to meet in person. Members of the county board will join the meeting remotely. The public is invited to join the meeting remotely by phone. Um, uh, or I believe now Ryan says we have a YouTube link. Um, and you can live stream this meeting. Anyway, we'll rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Public forum. Is there anybody that wishes to speak at public forum? Mr. Chair, this is Kelly Schroeder, County Auditor Treasurer. Yes. Um, yes, I was just hoping to note that um, today is the start of the filing period for state and county offices um, for the primary and general election in November. Um, so we are close to the public, obviously. Um, and so we're encouraging folks to contact myself and request the materials or you can go on the Secretary of State's website or I also have um, created a Pine County web page that has all of the materials on it as well that can be downloaded um, and then you can mail in the the documents or put them in the Dropbox um, and with the fee with the filing fee as well. Thank you Kelly. I was for some reason uh, wondering about that when I was making toast this morning. So thanks for that update. Uh, I see we have uh, Representative Nelson on a call. Um, and we'll, we'll probably ask him uh, during our reports if he is still around to give us a, um, some feedback and a little discussion, if that's all right. I'm not hearing any other. Um, I see call in user five and the caller user four. I'm not sure who they are, Ryan, but um, I don't hear anybody speaking up. We will move on to the agenda. Uh, we have a few additions. Uh, David, do you want to give those to us? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, we have in addition to consent agenda item number 8B, a uh, new hire, uh, part-time correction officer, Sean Mitchell, effective June 2nd. And then we have some additional information for regular agenda item number four, uh, the Pine County Sheriff Squad and body camera update. And we have some additional information for regular agenda item number five, uh, summary of activities for the U of M extension update. And then we have some additional information for regular agenda item number six, the coronavirus update. And we have uh, Amy Isaacson, the court administrator, who will provide uh, an update on the court's activities and a PowerPoint presentation by Becky Foss on the coronavirus. And then uh, the rest of that will be a discussion by the county board of uh, direction uh, for county facilities. And all of that additional information is posted on the county website uh, for anyone who wants to review that information. Ludwig will move as amended. 
Moral I'll second. Any discussion? Questions? If not, the clerk will call the roll. District 3, Commissioner Shapey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Mickrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. Okay, that passes. We will uh, move to the approval of the minutes for the May 5th, 2020 County Board uh, minutes and summary for publication. Make right, we'll move. Moral We got a motion by Mickrit, second by Moore. Any discussion? Did you have a point? Okay. Um, clerk will call the roll. District 4, Commissioner Mickrit? Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. District 1, Chair Holland? Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. District 3, Commissioner Shapey. Aye. Okay, that passes. We'll move on to the minutes of board's reports and correspondence of the Pine County Extension Committee of February 20th and the Pine County Zoning Board of February 27th. Someone's got a radio. That was a long one. <laughs> We're looking for a motion for that. Let me go move. Make right second. Discussion? If not, the clerk will call the roll. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. District 1, Chair Holland? Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore? Aye. District 3, Commissioner Shapey? Aye. District 4, Commissioner McRae? Aye. All right, that passes. We'll move to the consent agenda. Commissioner Moore will move the consent agenda. Mickrod. Got a motion by Moore, seconded by Mickrod uh, on the consent agenda. Any discussion? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Holland? Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore? Yes. District 3, Commissioner Shady? Yes. District 4, Commissioner Rivers? Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. Okay, we'll move on to the regular agenda. Facilities Committee. Uh, who's gonna take that, Josh? Yeah, I was just pulling up the minutes, sorry. All right. uh, so we did have a meeting. Um, looks like, uh, what did we discuss? I'm just trying to figure it out here. Okay, uh, the COVID-19 update. So we we did discuss um, with this uh, shutdown potentially coming to an end here fairly soon, um, how, re how the county is gonna responsibly open our facilities, um, having the right equipment um, safe, uh, have, having um, uh, the disinfecting and the hand sanitizer and some plexiglass um, in the spaces that people are gonna need it. Um, I don't think the plan is to, to move right at 100%, at you know, everybody back in the courthouse. Um, we're gonna just try to phase it in. The people that can still work remotely, 
um, still do that and and get some people in there to open the doors and and that kind of stuff. Um, we also did talk. That was just real quick on that. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I can answer that or or Matt can. But we did also talk about long-term space planning. So right before all this went down, we actually interviewed some architects to possibly put a uh, annex on the on the new courthouse, um, and and uh, so we could get everybody on the same facility. Well, the same week we interviewed. Uh, architects this all happened and we had to have everybody start working from home now we we have i can't remember exactly how many working from home but it seems to be working pretty good we we did a little bit of digging and trying to figure out about how many people we would have to have permanently work from home or out of our spaces to have everybody in the same facility without having to build anything or without having to have a second facility like the South Pine Government Center. The magic number seems to be about 30. Um, and uh, that's about 22% of, of 136 employees that are currently, I believe that's currently working remotely. David, if I'm wrong, Step in, but uh, that seems to be a pretty realistic More? goal. Yes. I mean, just that 136 really represents the group of employees that would be in play at the South Pine Government Center, the main floor of the courthouse, and the North Pine Government Center. And so, it, some of those 136 are currently still working in the office because we need uh, some people in the office. Others are rotating in the office, and most of them are pretty exclusively working from home. But that 136 is that group of employees who are are in in play as we look at how do we arrange space to bring everyone in Pine City to the courthouse uh, and make that work because some of uh, we may have some employees up at the North Pine Government Center who can continue to telework and then potentially uh, relocate some workers from the Pine City uh, facility to the Sandstone facility. But they're, as you indicated when you started out, these are just rough numbers to see if the math works. Uh, they're not specific decisions on any positions or employees. Yeah. So I think the goal of the facility committee is and our long term space planning is not to build another facility or add on to the existing courthouse. Um, it is our plan to figure out how to vacate the South government or South Pine Government Center and um, and find a tenant for that. And we're openly communicating with the city about them taking it over um, and uh, um, then working on getting some people working remotely and or transitioning in and out of space, so some flex space, um, and uh, getting everybody back up to speed at the at the courthouse, the, the existing courthouse. So um, it's funny how a pandemic can change things. Um, you know, just this is one thing with the teleworking that for us, we've tried it in the past and it's not really been hugely successful, but when you're forced to do it, it was, it's been very successful. Um, you know, I haven't had all the updates as you guys have been having, but um, from what I understand, it's not perfect, but it is working. So if we can figure out, you know, a few people that either want to or can work remotely on um, even a rotation or permanently, um, this could, this could be a, a good thing going forward for for Pine County and and uh, um, we'll see how it goes, but we'll keep you informed anyways. Um, and then under project updates, uh, we did complete or Pete did complete some updating, updated lighting in the courtrooms um, in a couple of the courtrooms. And I can't remember for sure if he was gonna do the third, but he did do two of the three. Um, and uh, he was talking about like candle power in the in in these uh, courthouses was 
the threshold, it was like half of the threshold it should be. Now it's quite a bit above. So um, it was a pretty good um, improvement. Um, I have never been in the courtroom, so I couldn't tell you before or after. Actually, I was in there once. Sorry, we did do a picture in there one year. So um, that's the only time I've been in them. Um, maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing. I don't know. But uh, so, and there was a few other things. They they striped the parking lot at the existing courthouse. They just been trying to get a bunch of things where when there's not a lot of people walking around and doing things, where they can open them up, work on them, so they don't have to close it back up and just getting a lot of a lot of cleaning and that kind of stuff done. So I guess from there, uh, Matt, did you have anything else to add? No, you covered it great, Josh. <laughs> Sorry. If anybody's got any questions, hopefully I can answer. Thank you, Facilities Committee. Um, I think you've, you've hit on a great plan and, and uh, you got some support, I think, from the rest of the board to, to carry out um, how we can place workers going forward. Let's see. Personnel committee. Steve, do you want me to take that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I have to. I just lost my screen. So. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Chair, go ahead. Um, so, I'm going to go through the whole thing and then make one motion at the end, cause just because of the way we have to vote. Is that all right with you? That is perfect. Okay, thank you. So, we met on May 12th and uh, made the following recommendations. Under Health and Human Services, we approved the PERA phase retirement option for Case 8 Betty Kozlowski. And that will begin June 1st, 2020, and it'll be ending no later than May 31st, 2021, at which time she will formally retire. And it's all in agreement with the employment and county policies and collective bargaining. Um, then moving on, we approve the hiring of a new health educator position and eliminating uh, a case aid position in the public health department. Health educator grade is a 10 with a minimum hourly rate of 2470. The increase in staff expense will be offset by third party billing and the number of FTEs in the public health will remain the same. Moving on to sheriff's office and jail, we acknowledge the resignation of part time corrections officer Preston Otterer, effective April 22nd, 2020 and authorize the backfill of the position and any subsequent vacancies that would occur through uh, internal promotions or lateral transfer. In Sheriff's Office Dispatch, we acknowledge the resignation of part-time probation, probationary dispatcher Amanda Morris, effective April 23rd, 2020, and authorize the backfill of that position and any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to in internal promotion or lateral transfer. In the highway department, we acknowledge the retirement of county right away manager Todd Lindstrom, who has been there for that'll be his retirement will be May 29th, 2020. And he has 37 plus years of service to the county, which that's a long run there. Um, backfill is not requested due to the recent hiring of the assistant county engineer who will fulfill the same role. The rest of the meeting was it's in there. You'll have the notes as just information on data, but that's the um, important points. And I will move those, Mr. Chair. We got a motion. Do we have a second? Yeah, Commissioner Chafee, second. Thank you. Any discussion, questions? Uh, I do have one uh, yeah. question. Is uh, Todd getting his clock or? Are we mailing it to them or, or what? <laughs> We're gonna FedEx it. <laughs> Through you Mark. We'll put it we'll put it in a in a dump truck and deliver it to his end of his driveway. Maybe once we got uh we can have public meetings, we might have to have him come back to get it, huh? And his picture with think, the chair. I think I think we'll try to work out something with him. That's a commendable number. 
37 years. Wow. So we got any other comments? If not, the clerk will call the roll. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Shafee. Aye. District 4, Commissioner McGritt. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Holland. Yes. We'll move on to the Health Insurance Committee. Uh, Matt, you up for that one too? Well, I can start it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think probably the best way to start that is we're always trying to figure out how we can do um, the best with our insurance without having huge increases. And uh, if I back up for a little history there, you know, we, we tried to well, last year, and I think it started the year before that, we were, we were having meetings with resource and we were trying to figure out a way we could do a three year agreement or something and come up with some models so we could predict our rate of increase, which they seem to be all in on. Well, then earlier this spring or late winter, we had a meeting with them and, and they had a good, I don't know, almost a year to work on that. And they came back with nothing. Um, it's like they had forgot about, forgot we even had that conversation. I'm not saying that, it's just, it's frustrating. And I know it's a difficult market, but anyway, so Dave and um, the, the insurance committee is, is a good cross section of our county employees and um, staff. And, and so we reached out to Justin and he, he, we're looking at a lot of options. Again, to try to figure out how we can get the best deal. Um, so, in our last meeting, we went through the health, you know, the plan and the claims history and all of our insurance goals. And we even covered a new one to us, um, which was an introduction into self insuring, which I think it's worth looking at. And we've made no decisions yet. We're just looking at that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm a little nervous about that myself, but I think there's a way that that could work. I'm not going to rule it out yet. I'm staying very open-minded. So anyway, we decided at the um, insurance meeting that as a group that we'd go forward and he's going to research all possible options for us and put them on the table. So at least we'll, we'll look at everything that's possible for us and a way to ensure the um, employees of Pine County. So if somebody wants to add detail to that, Feel free, David, or anybody else that's part of that committee. But that's just kind of a rough summary of what happened. And thank, thanks, Matt. You covered it well. I, I'm just going to add a couple of things that I think we've come to the realization over the years that we can get as mad as we want at the insurance company for raising our rates 20%, yep. 10%, or giving us a decrease. But it, it's a direct reflection of our usage. And, and the way we're set up now, we, we, get, we get a little bit of a buffer if we have really, really high usage, which would require a 20% increase, we pay it after the fact in next year's rates. If, if we look at self-insurance, we pay the rate that, that it goes up the year it happens. And, and so the, the thing that we save are the administrative costs. And, and I'm still um, need a little guidance of how, how much that really is. I think it's significant. I think it's way more than 1% of our levy, total levy. So I, that makes, that makes me um, wonder if if this isn't part of a solution. Because like Matt said, what we're really looking for is, is to try to get some rate stabilization. If we can plan, when no, nobody likes going into something thinking our insurance rate's gonna go up six or seven or 8%. But if we look back over some period of time 
like a 10 year period. We're looking at it. We've had about a 7.2 or so increase per year. Some of those years it's been, we actually got a decrease. Some we had these horrendous increases. And so what we're, what we're looking for is if we had a crystal ball and we could predict that we could say it's going to be 6.8% increase for the next five years, then we can budget for that. It's a lot, you know, even though we don't like the number, we can budget for it. And so um, I think it's the predictability um, factor that I'm looking for, and I think the committee is looking for. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd like to go back to what you said, like when we, when we talk about, you know, the, the claims base is based on our claim. Right. You know, and, and I, I know we initially looked at this because they're obviously able to manage resources, just a middleman managing our stuff through to Blue Cross. So we thought, why can't we do that ourselves? So, and I agree totally with what you said. And, and I think what my realization was, is we're always going to pay. So if we have a bad year and you said it, we're, you know, we're going to, if we're self-insuring, we're going to pay it the year we have it instead of the next year when they up the rates and you're going to pay them, you're going to pay that freight. So the right. dollars are going to cost you always pretty much the same. The, the only way I see that we can save huge amounts of money is to, is what? lower the service that we get. So if we want to, and, and usually that means raising deductibles and we've had to do that over the years, almost every year anyway, just to get it in some kind of a uh, price range we could afford. So we've got a great committee. Uh, like Matt said, they're a pretty good cross section of our, our employees. We, we are concerned about our employees. We think it's uh, a good reason to work at Pine County because we have we have a good uh, insurance policy, and uh, we want to we want to keep that in focus all the time because we care about our our people that work here. Any more on that? Any questions on it, David? Did we forget anything? I think the update was pretty comprehensive. I would just add that uh, Justin is looking at all of the options we have. So we're gonna be investigating the self-insurance, but we're also gonna keep on the table resources as an option and just doing a direct bid uh, in the market, which we've done before uh, as a way to better position ourselves to negotiate with resources. And so the idea is to develop information uh, over the spring and early summer so that we can come back with some hard numbers uh, and be in a position to make an informed decision versus just waiting until August or September when resources tells us tells us the number that we have and then we don't have time to make adjustments. It's been the biggest single change that that we have gotten in the last few years when when Justin came on board is he he's able to work those numbers so we we know kind of now what those numbers are going to be instead of knowing what those numbers are in the end of August and then never having enough time to put together an RFP and and rebid the thing so we we've kind of we've kind of moved the game ahead a little bit um, Mr. Chair, yes, I got a question. Yeah. So, in in any time, I you know I I haven't been on the insurance committee, but I always paid attention. We've never had more than like a one or two year contract, right? Has it always right. been? Okay. I I, think, I was. Yeah. Yeah, I I couldn't remember because when we rebid. Um, like we've done where we just go out and, and, uh, if we don't like the number, which we don't ever like the number, but when we go out and rebid, it doesn't void a contract that we had or anything like that. Does it? No, 
we're at the end of our contract now. Uh, so it's time to get something else. In the old days, we typically get an extension or a one year contract. We've really tried to get two years. We've asked for three. We've had a hard time getting a third year uh, from anybody, but um, we've had we've had pretty good success at least getting two year contracts, which gives us a little bit of a time to react. All right. All right. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, has anyone heard the impact that this COVID-19 is having on insurance companies? And is that changing anything? Is I've heard nothing. I, I heard early on that it was actually probably going to drive rates down a little bit, usage rates. But I think we're going to have to wait until we're at, at least into the second end of the second quarter, which means that we're we're not going to know that completely at the time we got to go out for bids. They're going to use first quarter of 2020 and second, third, and fourth quarter of 19 for our rate structure. Thank you. Okay. Nothing else. We'll move on to the body camera, quad camera presentation. Um, Jeff, and Ryan, are you? I think this is your show. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman of the board, yep. I think we can make this work. So Ryan's going to run the slides, and I will try to keep up with him. So uh, we'll take it from here. So yeah, we are at the point of. Um, obviously, you guys are aware we've been talking uh, cameras for quite a while now. Uh, we put out the uh, RFP, and we're at the point of uh, making a decision on a on a vendor. And uh, so, would like to discuss uh, where we're at with that process. Uh, that's me echoing or not? But um, so we did get five proposals back. Uh, we narrowed it down to three that we did a. Uh, demo essentially with and uh, are now narrowed down to one, which we've identified as uh, utility associates is their name. Um, and we were also asked uh, in the process to come up with a, uh, I guess, more of a, a five year kind of term of, of what it would cost the county realistically. And so we did that as part of the RFP as well. So um, at this point, the uh, Utility associates uh, came in at about 380,000 for the five years. And as we've talked about before, there's uh, a slide at the back that breaks it down into uh, dollars per year, but the uh, tech fund has the, the lion's share of it. And then there would be some obviously uh, ongoing costs annually to be worked into the budget. So part of the reason uh, we what we liked about utility was again listening to what you guys had brought up at our uh, our meetings leading up to it, and uh, Commissioner Ludwig was um, had some good points on officer safety and adding another uh, element to the officers' responsibilities instead of necessarily concentrating on their safety, public safety, they would have to be worrying about pushing another button or manipulating something that would take them off their their true task so um, utility has a really good solution on that from what we've found um, and it also has um, some of the features that were on that slide that we can i can probably talk about as we go through it sorry ryan i'll try to confuse you as much as possible um, so utility what they essentially do is they use a uh, cell phone platform that they uh, disable all of the functions except the camera and then some of their um, stuff that goes into it. So the platform is, you know, as you can see in the picture on that slide, it is essentially looks like a cell phone, um, handles like a cell phone. And with it being that slim design, uh, they um, identified the camera hanging on the outside of the uniform as uh, one of the drawbacks of the traditional body cameras because they're 
um, attached. And if they're attached, they can be detached. And ultimately, um, it's going to be at the wrong time when, when things get pulled off. When you're in a struggle, when you want to get good video, your, your chances of losing your camera are pretty high. So what they have done is uh, developed a system that actually gets um, sewn into uniform shirts, jackets, basically any external clothing uh, can be modified to take the camera and it's thin enough so you don't even notice it's there. Um, it's again, not a big bulky thing hanging off the front of officer's uniform. So um, there's several advantages to that. And, and it really seemed to, the demo that we had with that seemed to really um, be a good solution in my opinion. So they're pretty heavy on the tech as I kind of touched on. Um, they've got sensors within the, uh, the system that uh, automate a lot of things. And one of them is a, a holster sensor. So whenever an officer draws their, their duty weapon, it activates the holster sensor that, and then sends a signal to the camera to start recording if it isn't, and also sends a camera to the bigger system, um, which would then also notify anyone who's working um, that someone has drawn their gun. And also dispatch would get a notification that an officer has drawn their gun and it sends out GPS locations again. And worst case scenario, not in your car, you're out getting coffee or something at, at a gas station and something happens, you don't have to worry about turning on your body camera, calling dispatch and drawing your weapon to engage a, a would be robber, if you will. Um, it takes care of that. So it, it really does, again, answer that problem with a really good solution, I think. Also built into the system is uh, a, a foot pursuit activation. Um, so again, if you get out of your, or if you're outside of your car and you have to start running, you don't have to worry about activating your camera. Again, you can take care of business that you have to take care of. It will automatically start your camera for you and send the, the, the messages like we talked about before. Um, and I did verify that it would go off even if it were me trying to run. So the sensors must be pretty good. Another thing that they've automated is um, there's a CAD uh, interface that um, they will do. We have to work with our CAD vendor to make sure that it works on that side and I'll on a dis full disclosure on that. Um, but you can, with that, anytime there is a call that we can designate if it's a domestic, that uh, policy mandates you record, we can set that up as soon as they get within a certain uh, perimeter of that call, camera comes on. So there's a lot less chance of people missing um, the recording as we've talked about in some of the other uh, meetings we've had with the concerns that, you know, what do you do when you have no video when everyone's supposed to have video? So that is again, is another way to um, avoid officer uh, not being able to activate it or thinking they activated it missing it or something along those lines there's also uh, an officer safety all of it's kind of officer safety with the automatic notifications and the mapping and stuff that gets built into it um, but the one that they're really proud of and i agree greatly so is uh, an officer down sensor so it will actually if the camera lays uh, horizontal um, for, again, we can set those parameters from 10 seconds to 30 seconds or what have you. Um, the camera will detect that. It will actually talk to the officer and say, um, officer down notification in 30 seconds and then 20 seconds and count it down. And, and if they don't respond or correct that, um, it will send an automatic notification um, like we talked about with the holster sensor, it goes out to everyone that's on duty with a map, turn by turn directions, um, and also sends that to dispatch so they can get um, first responders or appropriate care to them. And they actually had a, uh, a save with an officer who got into a foot pursuit, um, got that taken care of, everyone left the scene except him. He uh, was going back to his car, didn't feel good, and next thing he knows, he's out. 
uh, system made the phone call for them, if you will. And um, they were able to, another feature that the system has is uh, you can go in and view the camera live. So dispatch was able to log into his camera and could see sky in the corner of a squad car. Um, obviously didn't respond to the radio calls or anything like that. Um, got people there. Uh, as they say, he had a cardiac event and uh, had a successful save on him. And I think within a week, they, uh, his wife gave birth to one of their children. So they uh, were, again, rightly so, pretty proud of that uh, technology saving a life. So, um, so along with the body camera, there, there's the built-in squad part as well. And it really, it all kind of is one big system. It communicates with, with each other. So this, the body camera can be a standalone. It stores data in it. When it gets within range of the squad, it um, downloads to the squad. The squad then downloads to the cloud or uploads, whichever way that direction is. Um, so, it, and it all works together as um, integrating so you can see what's going on in the body and the squad at the same time. The internal stuff in the, in the squad can either be run through a laptop or it can be run on a tablet as you see on that slide there. Um, you know, it's, it's front seat, back seat, so you get what's going on behind you when you're transporting somebody as well. Um, so it covers all of that pretty, pretty much like all systems do anymore. Um, it's more of that tech on the backside or the uh, integration of, of some other stuff that, that really set them apart, in my opinion. Um, so again, you can set the vehicle sensors. So if uh, somebody gets a, ca a call, they activate their, their lights and sirens on the way to that call. That will automatically activate the car uh, recording. So you can see what's going on on the road as they're driving. Um, and then you can have it set up. So as soon as they open the door, then that activates their body camera. So now you've got the squad going. You're not recording while you're driving down the road, the steering wheel. Um, but as soon as you open the car door, you're recording what what the officer is seeing and all of those sensors are set on on our policy and our parameters so it's again you can integrate as much as you want you can customize it which really was a big selling point on them um, on the next slide you've got um, or the next couple slides there's a uh, action zones that you can set up so if we have a, uh, an event that's going on at the casino that's uh, a large concert when we get back to having those again. Um, dispatch can, can actually set up a action zone that would automatically trigger a camera to be recording. Not that you'd necessarily want to record all of what's going on at that, that concert, but um, if it's something a little more hot. And what they pointed out was in the uh, Las Vegas shooting, there were over a a hundred body cameras in that scene and only two got activated. So something you obviously can avoid by having automatic stuff set up. Um, another thing it does really good with the mapping, um, you get to see what's going on, but then also it lays a, a, a trail on the map. So you can put that video on a, spot on the earth, if you will, in kind of the same thing and run the bread trail crumb where the officer or the camera would have been to where they found the evidence. You can make marks on your bread trail crumb, label them evidence found, or they threw the gun or whatever you want and go back and it just integrates all of that so you can see what's going on through the video. You can also see it on a map. Really, really good for, for evidence and, and um, that kind of stuff later back. Um, it also is really quick to get up into the cloud. So um, we can actually get that downloaded as the officer is recording it essentially, and then be able to view it just as quickly. So it, it again is really, the data is getting pushed out there really fast. Uh, one of the things that I, liked about this and some of the other, other over some of the other systems we looked at was 
Um, they already, it comes with redaction in it, as you know, um, state statute and policy um, requires us to redact uh, certain uh, faces, uh, audio. Um, so we, we, some of the other systems we looked at, it was kind of seemed to be more of an afterthought that, oh yeah, we can, we can kind of do that. And you have to send it to almost a third party with what you want them to redact and then send it back. And it was kind of really clunky. Um, this um, redaction software is built into the system and can do it in a matter of a few clicks. And you can set it to blur all faces or just designated faces. Um, and again, it's really customizable on, um, on how you set it up, which is what, again, statute requires us to do. And, and um, this one seemed to fit the bill pretty good on that. Another thing I thought was really nice on this system is you can set up links for that video. So if we need to um, do a media release that we want to um, have everyone access in the media, we can just send out our normal press release that we had this incident. If you want to view the video, click here. And then we can set that to be the active for a week or whatever it is. And then we don't have people wanting to get copies burned on CD or DVD or uh, view it, you know, and that kind of stuff. So it really helps push out the message that we need to send um, at, at the right times. And with that, we can also set up with uh, the county attorney's office, uh, send them a link where they can click on it and have access to it. And we can oh. set the abilities on what they can do with it, whether it's just view or if they can download it and uh, disseminate it from there. And then the system also allows, um, I was told, any um, surveillance video from a gas station or anything else, we can incorporate into that. So not only do we have our video, what we recorded, but we've got those bigger overviews that would come in from the businesses and again, would be in one package that we could coordinate how we how we send that out. Uh, also allows us to use the the phone features for audio recordings. So we can use that as our, our tape recorder that we uh, used to use at one point and, and the camera system. So again, it will provide that metadata for where the camera is taking pictures. And um, more and more, we're getting requests for uh, not only the pictures, but the, the metadata that goes with it. And this, this all incorporates it into the reports that we can run and, and what we can look at. So, um, and the avail web, which is on the second to the last slide there, it uh, is kind of the, how we access it. So we can access it from any computer because it's web-based. We wouldn't have to run into the office, look at video, process video from here if, if it was something that we need um, immediate action on. So if we have a major incident, we can um, view it from, as they kept saying, the beach in Mexico, but since I've never been there, a deer stand in Minnesota might be more likely. Um, and again, it just helps with that decision process because you can see literally on a map where all your officers are because you're going to see where their cameras are and be able to make good higher level decisions on uh, resources that you need, where you need people to be positioned. And again, that's a, a permissions base, so we could set it up for sergeants and above or dispatchers or whatever level that that's appropriate for those. So the last slide is the uh, is the the money slide and it breaks down a little bit on what. Um, their proposal was um, based on our conversation. Um, there, there may be some modifications we can make to that that would that would be beneficial to the county uh, if we extend the term uh, they said they could probably do better than that again um, time will tell um, but my request is that we uh, that you would approve uh, utility associates as the uh, preferred vendor for the RFP and and allow me to continue down the uh, the road of uh, a contract with them with some flexibility on, on how that gets ultimately um, formulated and report back to you for the final approval on the contract. And if anyone's still listening, I will 
you're done. Thanks, Jeff. That was uh, that was good. Um, does anybody have any questions? I do. Ludwig has questions. Yep. Um, Jeff, I have three. Um, so the first one is the modifications to the uniforms, jackets, and holsters. Um, just a question that are you going to modify what we have or are officers going to have to reissue? And my second question is you were showing that um, pursuit on foot or whatever, or, but I'm thinking in a car and you could show the map or the trail. Is it possible for the officer to hit, uh, like say a uh, suspect throws evidence out at night, he can just hit a waypoint and then keep going and then will it log where he saw something fly out of the car? That's, and then my last point is when you blur the faces in something, uh, a, a picture, and then you discover that one of those people could be your suspect, can you unblur that for identification at least on your side? Yeah. So the uniform alteration was a concern of mine going into it as well. Um, and they realized obviously the same thing, I think early on that, um, could be an issue with their product. So what they actually have built into the contract or their proposal and said they would be willing to modify the contract to fit too, is they will do two uniform shirt modifications under the contract. And then anything after that, um, they'll work with us and they haven't found a, um, article of clothing that they haven't been able to modify yet. And then they also will, um, if we, I think some of the major like dolls and other uniform people are already up on that. So we could order that built into a shirt and then they would also come up and, um, work with a local vendor that, that we've been using in say Aspen mills and teach them on how to install their product. So if they're willing to, that is, um, so we could get that all done locally. So it's a little quicker on the turnaround. Uh, but they have a built-in uh, seamstress uh, part of their um, company, and and we send them stuff, and they'll send it back. The uh, GPS, yeah. So we the both the phone and the car have tracking on GPS. So regardless if it's uh, a, a foot pursuit where we're trying to mark breadcrumbs um, or a vehicle pursuit, you can mark them as you go up to. So, um, you know, we had that just the other day where um, somebody's trying to get away on 35 and start pitching stuff out. So the deputy would be able to um, create marks basically in, in real time um, as, they're, as they're dealing with that. Or again, dispatch good or supervisor good that, that would have access to those. So your deputy can drive and all that. Um, the redaction, so what, the, the raw video never gets altered. So there's always the, you know, if we do something that we have to redact to release, uh, for court purposes, the raw video is still there for the judge to determine if what gets, you know, used in court, like always. Um, and you can, okay. you can, therefore, you, you know, you go back to the raw video if you need to alter something else and, and have version two or three or what have you. Um, and, and what they showed is really good. It, it did facial recognition essentially. So you, they showed where you had three people in the frame, they blurred one and then they moved down from person to person to person and only the one that they identified to be redacted got redacted. Then they did it the opposite where two were and, it, and did the same thing. And they can take in that picture they took and blurred, they actually have skin blur. So the system will, will um, automatically flag anything that's skin and blur it. So it sets that up. If that's all you need to do is show what happened and you don't want to identify anyone, you, you eliminate everyone's face in one click essentially instead of frame by frame like some of the other systems. Thank you. Jeff, I have a couple of questions and or comments is and in the batteries because it it's it's a regular cell phone so they have people have to remember to charge that 
every time their shift is done, I would assume. Yeah, so there's uh, they say it's a 16 hours of recording time. Um, so there's other standby time in that. Our normal shifts are 12 right. hours, so nobody's going to ever record a full 12 hours in one shift. And then they also say the batteries are capable of a uh, like a 15 minute charge will get you back to like 50 percent or something. So right. um, they were pretty good about answering to that requirement that we had as well. And it sounds like you don't have to be a NASA engineer to run the stuff. So uh, that's always concerning. And that's a good thing for me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's something we've, we've talked about for years, actually, and it kind of fell off the table and came back. And, and so I, I, the tech committee has kind of been, um, apprised of this all along and, um, and, it, uh, it right now seems like this is a much better product than we had anticipated it could be. So thank you very much for the due diligence that um, you and Ryan have taken on. Um, at this point, do, do we need a motion to move forward or is the tech committee's recommendation enough to move forward until we get a final, final number? Mr. Chair, members yes. of the board, this is David. Uh, the request is for board direction to identify the uh, utility of the preferred vendor and direct staff uh, and the sheriff to begin the contract negotiation phase. Is that direction a consensus or should we make a motion? A motion, if you would, please. Okay. And I am looking for a motion to um, have the sheriff uh, move ahead with uh, utility as our vendor and negotiate a final contract. Commissioner Morrow, make that motion. Let me go second. Any other discussion or questions? Yeah, one, Mr. Chair. Yes. We've, we've funded this um, project already, correct? Yes, we have been setting aside money in our tech fund to take care of the initial purchase and then the, the yearly 34,000 something will come out of general fund dollars in the years going forward. It's kind of like, I think I made the comment before, you know, we buy, we buy vehicles and stuff and we, and then we buy gas and tires and oil changes out of our general budget. And really that's kind of what we're doing here. It's a big purchase, but I think it's something in this day and age we need to move forward. So we do have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Yeah, I would just like to say um, we did have this in the in the tech committee budget. Um, when we did it, it was the initial purchase, uh, not the not the yearly kind of maintenance fee. So that is the the extra over the five years. Is, and actually, I think correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ryan or the sheriff. I think these guys were the cheapest too. So it's it's kind of one of them. It was a it was a win win on all sides. It it seems a little more than I think what we all had in our head, but we didn't look at it over five years when we were looking at the original purchase. So that's where that maintenance fee comes in, and which every one of them has it. So, yeah. But any other? Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, I just have a quick question for Jeff. Um, do our neighboring counties have this uh, capability? And if they do, have they? Do you know of any county that's used this this vendor, or you know, do you have any experience with them from anybody else? I'm just curious. Yeah. So, to answer your first question, no. Um, 
none of our neighbors do. Uh, they all they're starting to go to body cameras, but everyone's kind of on a different system. Um, we did uh, hear back from Olmstead County. They they are the first uh, that went to this in Minnesota. Uh, I reached out to them at the at the beginning of the process, and uh, before we met with them um, a week or so ago. Uh, to get an update and they spoke very highly of them obviously there's glitches there's concerns here and there um, but they uh, the one thing they really spoke on that that means a lot to me is the customer service and their willingness to um, make things right and come up with solutions um, they're again saying all the right things on that and and from right now it, it sounds really encouraging uh, uh, a selling point to me is pretty much everyone I talk to is former law enforcement, so they understand uh, kind of the whole bigger picture of what that means to the agency and um, how something not working could really destroy people's uh, um, willingness to, to embrace the technology. So uh, to me, that really speaks highly, too, of what they're um, doing to prevent that. Thanks, Jeff. Any other questions? If not, the clerk will call the roll. District 3, Commissioner Shafee? Yes. District 4, Commissioner McRae? Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? Matt, did you vote? Aye. District 1, Chair Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. That passes and we'll move on to the extension update from Suzanne Heinrich. Suzanne, I saw you there before. Hi, Mr. Chair. Hi. Hello. And thank you very much for inviting me to um, give a little update from the world of extension. So it'll be short, um, but I really wanted to comment on how I appreciate how efficient your meetings are. You've gotten good at this WebEx stuff. So <laughs> um, I like a lot of the uh, work that you're working or that you've changed to by doing online meetings. Extension has really um, embraced that as well. So um, currently the extension staff, is, they're all working at home, but much of their work is online, um, connecting with um, the public or providing educational efforts online. So um, right now we do have a date of June 30th is when we're gonna continue to do online. That's being assessed. Hopefully toward the end of the summer, we can get back into um, in person or at least maybe at the very bare minimum in the field, having a workshop in the field. We'll just see, we're very cautious on that. So um, David and Debbie sent you an update and it's on the county website. So you have that, it's a written report. I just wanted to cover a general overview of a couple of things from each of the staff members with an extension of what they've been doing in the last few uh, weeks and a couple of months. So since Rod started on April 6th, he's the new ag educator. You've met him. Um, he has started a Facebook page. And so I want to encourage you to find that and like it. So I'm going to share it if I can here. Let's see if I can do it. Yep, I can. So hopefully you are able to see the Facebook page that Rod has started. His goal is 100 people by um, June 1st, and he's up to 65. So right now he's been sharing a lot of information on this website, probably five or six times a week he's sharing information. He will back off as time goes and probably just do two updates a week or whatever's relevant. But right now he's just really trying to create a buzz and trying to get people to follow him on that page. So. I want you to know that that's out there. Um, a lot of what he's doing right now is kind of, you know, back of the room type of processing, trying to get to know people by phone. He's also 
doing a lot of merging. We had many um, mailing lists that he's working on trying to get one complete mailing list agriculture type folks in the county. And he's also planning with collaborators to do some uh, efforts, hopefully later on in the summer with soil and water, um, 4-H, um, NRCS and others. So he's looking at a fall winter series for beginner farmers, which is really great. Um, one thing I just wanna note is now that we have an ag educator in Pine County, Rod is very well poised to plug research in, in Pine County. He has been working on some research type grants in the past. And what's exciting about having him there, any local ag educator tries to get research that the university is involved in into their county. And so I think that is gonna happen. And so we'll have some local research results to be able to share with other farmers. So that's something that I look forward to seeing as, as Rod um, gets into this. So I'm gonna uh, stop. Well, actually I'll just go on to the next one. Um, I'm gonna share the 4-H um, page. Any questions on Rod and the Ag Educator component? Okay, I'll move on to 4-H. And um, now that we know that there isn't gonna be a county fair, Frank and others in the region are working on what's that look like. They wanna make sure there's a valuable and a, um, an interactive um, showcase for youth who have been working on their projects all year long. So that is in the works. But I wanted to show you as well online, uh, there is a lot of um, effort going into online workshops for kids. And yesterday afternoon, there were a lot of kids online doing science experiments with 4-H. Um, through a Zoom. And so kids had to gather up um, common household things, baking soda, maybe a couple of other things, and they did some experiments. This is an example that I'm sharing here of the STEM webpage for 4-H, and it has quite a few opportunities for families to work through curriculum, but also if they want to join upcoming events, they're listed on this page as well. It was funny that Commissioner Holland, um, you mentioned an, a NASA engineer because um, has been connecting with NASA and they, over the last few weeks, um, kids from Pine County, as well as 600 youth from across Minnesota have attended these weekly sessions with NASA engineers. So here's one of the NASA engineers um, in his um, broadcast to Minnesota 4-H'ers. So, um, yes, we might not be NASA engineers ourselves, but maybe some of these youth might be. So that's an article about um, this Meet a NASA Engineer effort that had been happening in the last few weeks. So I'll stop sharing my screen for a second and um, then go on to, I want to just highlight some of the work that's being done also. Well, any questions on 4-H? Okay. And I wanna highlight some of the things that the Master Gardeners are doing. They have had to really transition their work too. They had to cancel their horticulture day that was scheduled for April. They've also scheduled their upcoming plant or they've canceled their upcoming plant sale. And they had been raising some plants specifically for that plant sale. So they are working, they had been working with the schools and they distributed um, some plants along with information to students and worked with the science teacher in Hinkley and Finliston schools and got those out to kids. And uh, those kids are raising those plants. It was a plant called the Wandering Jew plant. And um, kids are now, that went home on the school bus to them. So there's some inventive things that are coming out of this new day of working in this pandemic. So also um, they've been interacting with other schools too, including uh, East Central and Willow River and Pine City to bring out um, newsletters for kids so that encouraging kids to get outdoors during this time and helping them think and see their yards differently. 
Jimmy Johnson is doing some SNAP-Ed health and nutrition work um, that has turned into way different. He usually goes into school districts. He usually meets with people also in community groups. He has been moving to a lot of Zoom meetings and they still have community groups going. Um, Jimmy's work is to bring a health and nutrition and um, recreation focus to those community groups. And he has a pastor network that is working on improved food access and they're doing uh, community gardens also in the community. So you'll read about that in the update and um, there's an updated update on the website uh, of this report. And as you know, we have Brianna Michaels who also is housed at the Pine County Extension Office. Brianna works mostly with Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and Boys Fort and then Pine and Itasca counties. She works on community groups and leading conversations she has taught quite a few workshops um, with counties, including Pine County, on a curriculum called Healing Through History, helping people understand um, the perspective from a Native American lens on what history has and helping to create some common understanding. She currently is working on a lot of um, kind of uh, not necessarily, she can't get into the community right now, so she's working on writing journal articles to make sure that this work is documented appropriately and then uh, working on evaluations for, for future work as well. So a couple things I want to just um, highlight in general across extension that extension or uh, residents in Pine County have access to too is I'll share my screen one more time. And I want to go to U of M Extension has a COVID-19 response page. So if you're looking for resources from Extension, you could just Google U of M Extension and COVID, and that will get you um, some resources. So it takes you to this landing page. Uh, it notes that all of our education right now has moved online. And um, there are lots of resources for families, but there's some things I wanted to show you specifically. So Extension has quite a we, large- We aren't seeing that page, Susan. You aren't? Thank no. you. I must not have clicked. Maybe David is sharing it. Yes, thank you. There. Be able to share it. I like that picture. Oh, am I sharing the wrong screen? Well, we're seeing your two daughters at a river. I'm sorry, that's the wrong screen. A I reminder, always be careful what you share. Right. <laughs> I appreciate you doing this. Um, we still see them. You can't take the share to the screen, take the screen to the share. Is that better? There you go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> if you would go down to the section entitled finances, um, extensions, educators, extension educators across the state, we have a team that works on finances. If you would click into the adjusting to income loss page, um, there's quite a few resources for people who are adjusting to a sudden income loss and um, strategies for spending, setting your spending priorities, but then also helping to budget, create budgets, how to spend less, how to adjust in various ways. So there's some tips and tricks on this page that can allow people to weather this time a little bit better. So David, would you back out of this page and go back to the COVID-19 page? And then if you would just go down right below to food support. Um, U of M extension was quick to create. It's for food support. One more section down, there you go. Okay, so um, you'll see a 14 day meal kit for rural grocery stores, that is um, available at many mom and pop grocery stores. So across Minnesota, U of M Extension has a following that they're working with mom and pop grocery stores to keep them alive. I mean, look at Pine City and Chris's. We know firsthand that um, this is a tough business to be in. If you click into that report right there, it shows, it gives um, a menu for 14 days someone could call into their grocery store store and say i want the 14-day meal kit would you please just box that up for me you can pick it up curbside it gives recipes there's many 
um, helpful hints on this page. And um, I wanted you to know about it because food insecurity is real. And this is one of the resources that helps people. So you can back out of that whenever you're ready. You'll have to go back and then back. And then go back to that food support landing at the COVID-19 page. And then over on the right, there was under, under food support again, there's curbside pickup and delivery. So we have created some guidelines or some suggestions for small town retailers and grocery. If you click into that again, you can find some suggestions on how to handle and best practices for curbside delivery and how to handle retail for um, small town grocery and retail establishments. So these are important resources that um, are being distributed to communities and just wanted you to know that these are available. And then the last thing I wanted to cover was um, the community economics web webinars. So that's the last link um, David in that email. So you'll have to go back to that. I know I'm making you do handstands. There it is. Wow. Yes. So I wanted you to know about this. This is already coming up on Thursday and I share I'm sharing this with you because I know your county board is very proactive in community development and making sure that you support the community and businesses. So this is a webinar that um, is happening. Um, they have one other one they're having this one and i'm sure they'll plan more this one is on retaining businesses during a pandemic it's on thursday um, at nine o'clock the guest speaker is going to be state economist laura kalambakitis so sh this would be if you wanted to register for this they're having this on thursday but they will have more workshops in this um, topic coming up so I hope that I've given you a flavor of what the county extension office is doing resources that you have available to you from the state extension as well. Thank you, Suzanne. I, I have uh, directed a couple of people to Rod so far because Good. Um, I, I think people need to know that resources available and they they had questions, you know, how do I I don't even know what they were seeding down a pasture, or hayland, or something. And Rod got him some info, just really timely. So appreciate, I appreciate that. you mentioning that because he said last week he had, I think, two calls. So two is better than zero, and I'm yep. hoping to double that as each day, <laughs> each week. So if you could all share that whenever you have someone that's having a question, that would be great. Um. But the other thing is, is um, as most of you know, the Pine County Fair did cancel for 2020, but one of the hard decisions of that was um, the 4-H kids. And so we have met with, as a statewide association with the 4-H leadership in trying to develop um, some kind of 4-H recognition day so depending on how things move along, um, a way that we could judge animals and projects without having people overnight their animals at the fair, you know, bring in today is sheep day or whatever. And, and uh, today is bring in your woodworking project or however that's gonna work. The details have not been worked out, but there's a lot of people that are uh, willing to step up to the plate and help kids and so that's encouraging and and uh, extension um, make sure we can do it in a in a way that's safe for everybody so thank you glad to hear that good and i know frank is very interested in that and so is minnesota 4-h so yeah yeah okay well thank you uh, another another um item is just this morning I was I was trying to help a local restaurant owner because they're being told as they start planning to reopen you know meat is is going to be in very short supply and and to try to line them up with some people who would have a steady supply of 
of murder and, and whatever. And we're lucky in Pine County, we have several people that have um, pretty large feedlots. So they have a steady supply of meat and we do have a USDA uh, uh, approved plant that we actually had an extension meeting at, I believe that I went to. Yes. Um, and so maybe um, we can get some of these people back to the origins where the it's locally sourced, it's locally processed, and now we can locally eat it. So mm -hmm. that would be pretty cool. You're right. I'll make sure that Rod is aware of that too. Yeah. That, yeah, he knows Lake Haven meets, but yes, I'll mention that to him. Okay. Um, any other questions for Suzanne? Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you. We'll move on to Corona's uh, response updates. Did you have anything first, David? Uh, we're not hearing you. Not hearing you. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. Do you want to take a five minute recess just to give people a chance to? I would love to. Before we let's move let's into take that? let's take a five minute recess, and then Amy, uh, you'll be on deck, and Becky. Are they opening anything? Of course, I forgot to I forgot to keep track of when we went on break, but eleven twenty. Eleven twenty, and it is uh, 
1124. So we got him another minute. How come it's 1128 on my microwave and it's 1124 on my oven? And it's 11 <laughs> to 1126 on my computer and it's 1125 on my watch. <laughs> Okay, it looks like most people are back. Amy, are you there? Hi. Oh my, look at that. You got the pilot headset on and everything. Can hear you, Amy. I'm doing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. You are breaking up a little bit. Okay, Amy, you can go ahead. An update as to what the courts are right now. Um, yesterday, we did have our. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now we can. Are you dialing in on your phone, Amy? Um, I think, I think Amy is, looks like she's frozen in time possibly. So we'll, we'll come back to her. If Becky, are you ready? Yep. Um, if you give me a second, I hope everybody can hear me. I will, um, share some content of yep. my screen. Um, I just want to make sure I have the right thing up. I Okay. I'm thinking everybody can see this. Okay. Yep, and it yep. looks like it's we, sharing. Yep, um, we have it. Awesome. So as a county management team, we've been meeting about uh, twice a week for the last several weeks, just um, updating each other on department head updates. Um, Sam and Denise are talking about the public health emergency and emergency management updates. And um, this presentation is really designed to give an update to um, the entire county board and just kind of summarize what we've seen so far and summarize some data. Um, because we want to make sure we're looking at the science and the data of this situation as um, as we move forward and just some ongoing questions that we can think about as we're making some key decisions moving forward. Um, so. This data is as of Sunday, so it's a few days old. Um, I could have probably ran myself ragged updating this continuously over the last 48 hours, and I've just decided not to do that. Um, but this information is a few days old, and I just want to be very honest about that. Um, I do cite the sources in this PowerPoint, so um, anybody can look up the CDC website or MDH website um, to get the most current daily update. Um, so on the slide, it lets it just informs everybody that as of Sunday, there were um, 
over 1.4 million positive cases of COVID in the United States. Um, we were approaching 90,000 deaths on Sunday. I believe we've gotten closer to that, maybe even surpassed that um, since Sunday night. Um, looking at the history of this, there's always talk, um, if you're watching the news or part of the management meetings about the exponential growth of this virus. And if you look at um, just snapshot points and times of how many cases are positive, you can kind of see what that looks like. Um, so, according to the CDC on February 16th, there were zero new cases. March 16th, um, 755 new positive cases across the nation. And then um, a lot of stuff happened between March 16th and April 16th. And I believe that really um, is a testament to everything that was happening in New York. There were over 29,000 new cases on April 16th. And then May 16th, we were still um, trekking upwards of about um, 32,000 case, positive cases on May 16th. Um, then, according to the CDC, they have um, some information about the breakdown of the cases by age. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in this virus um, really having a negative impact, um, serious Im impact mm -hmm. on the elderly, and that is certainly the case. Um, but as you can see in this slide, um, the uh, people who are testing positive are across the age ranges, um, with the lowest um, group being the young, younger population, which is consistent with at least what I'm hearing um, in the news. And so the biggest two areas that I have highlighted here are the 18 to 44 years of age and the 45 to 64 years of age. And the reason why I've highlighted that is because um, that's really um, who represents uh, my workforce um, at Health and Human Services, and I think that would be across the county organization. This information is posted on the MDH website, and um, as of Sunday, we had 15,668 positive cases to date. Um, and then a snapshot in time between March and May 11, let's um, just kind of signifies how fast we've grown um, in Minnesota with positive cases. So March 11th, there were 10 new positive cases. April 11th, there were 74 new positive cases. And May 11th, there were 734 new cases. And I think this um, is a testament to, again, the exponential growth that we're seeing. Um, in the beginning, when there were first positive cases in Minnesota, it could be tracked back to international travel or some cruise ship um, travel. And now we have, um, we've had it for a while, that community spread where we're getting it from each other versus being able to track it back to a, a certain um, event or a certain trip. So as of Sunday, 2,090 people in Minnesota were hospitalized. That's about 13.3% um, of the people who, who test positive. Um, uh, this lines up with the estimated 15% of serious cases, which we'll talk about later, what that means about a serious illness. Um, and it does not account for some of the people who are, you know, significantly ill, but haven't been hospitalized. Um, so 487 people were in the hospital on May 17th. 220 of them were in intensive care. Of the 2,900 of the 2,090 people who were hospitalized um, across this time, 716 people required intensive care unit. And um, the reason why I'm highlighting that is, I mean, that's uh, that's a kind of was kind of a reality check for me. That means like 35% of the total hospitalizations required some kind of intensive care stabilization. As of Sunday, there were 722 deaths across the state. I know that number's increased. Um, and 587 of these deaths could be traced back to long-term care or assisted living um, group con congregate care, which is 81.3% of the deaths in Minnesota. In the previous slide, um, we referenced severe illness. And so, um, According to the MDH website, um, some context around COVID is that most people who 
contract the virus are going to get better without too much of a problem. So severe illness is defined as those individuals who have required hospitalization. So I could be really sick, go to the emergency department or urgent care several times to get help, but unless I'm hospitalized, it's not necessarily defined as a severe illness. And we also know so far that the risk of severe illness is higher for some categories of people. I have some of these categories of people listed on the slide. So if you're age 65 and older, it puts you at higher risk. If you live in a nursing home or long term care facility, you're also at higher risk. And then there's also been conversations about being higher risk. If you have some underlying health conditions. Some of these conditions are severe obesity of a BMI of 40 or higher. Diabetes or chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma. Um, the next, plus, next slide is going to show you some data specific to Pine County around some of this um, higher risk category issues. So, according to um, the website um, that I've cited here, 20.7% of the population in Pine County is 65 or older. So, that's a group or a category of individuals who are at higher risk for severe illness. And then I've also pulled some information and data from the 2020 County Health Rankings, which is on the MDH website. And so I know Governor Waltz has to balance the whole population of the state of Minnesota. We're in Pine County, we're responsible for really um, Pine County data and Pine County actions. So according to the county health rankings, out of 87 counties, Pine County ranks 79th out of 87 counties. Um, that's not a good place to be. Um, I would much rather prefer us to be in the top 20, um, but that's how we're ranked right now in the state. According to these um, statistics, 20% of adults in Pine County are smokers. The state average is 15%. 35% of adults in Pine County are obese, and that's with a BMI of 30 or higher, and the state average is 28%. The diabetes prevalence in Pine County is 13%, and at a state level, it's at 8%. So in some of these higher risk categories, um, we have higher than average percentages compared to the state. We know that as we move forward, we've already, we're going to have to make a lot of decisions. We've already made a lot um, and those, uh, the seriousness of those decisions um, probably continue to grow as we move along. So, um, in looking at some of the data on the articles surrounding COVID, um, I wanted to extract some of that data um, to help us make some of those decisions. Um, what we know, and um, during this presentation, especially during this portion, there will be times that um, I call on Sam Lowe or she will be um, adding information as our public health director and public health expert. Um, and I think that's important um, to have her feedback as well. So really, um, successful infection or successful getting this virus is exposure to the virus over time or times time. We know that at least um, from this article, 44% of all people who get infected um, occur from people who aren't symptomatic, either they're pre-symptomatic or they're asymptomatic. So a lot of times um, people are spreading COVID and they don't even know that they have it. And so that's, that's a serious concern as we, as we move forward. And if we take out the outbreaks that we've seen in the nursing homes and long-term care facilities, we're really, we can really focus on three main areas, prisons, um, religious ceremonies, and workplaces. So prisons, even looking at the Pine County data, you can see how um, that's an area of concern. Um, and then what we can focus on is the workplace here in Pine County. So one of the, Quotes that stood out to me in this article is when you're in an enclosed space or place sharing the same air for a prolonged period of time, it increases your chances of exposure and infection. 
Social and physical distancing are great, but they're only going to provide you with so much um, protection. Uh, I wanted to show this picture, this diagram that was included in the article. Um, this is a restaurant type setup, um, and it kind of shows you in picture form how easily COVID can spread. Um, you'll see all those um, circles in highlighted in red on the exterior that indicates individuals who tested positive for COVID after this experience. Um, you'll see somebody identified as A1. A1 is the person who tested positive for COVID first. And again, this just shows you how quickly it can spread and how far it can spread. Because there's certainly uh, more than six feet apart between A1 and C1, and or at least I would think, and A1 and C2. So um, it just it go just goes to show um, it's really hard to contain this virus. And I added one more slide from yesterday's presentation. Um, this is a diagram that was in that article that shows um, a call center. So call centers are obviously, in my mind, I, when I get a picture of a call center, I get a picture of crowded people working in workstations or cubicles, doing a lot of phone contact with people over the phone. So the blue seats are individuals who have tested positive after one person came down with it. So clearly it spread quickly and um, I'm sure many people were pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic and therefore it was able to spread even, even more. Exponential growth is what we're hearing. Um, there's this article from the Imperial Academy and it talks about different tactics that um, countries and governments can take um, to really try to protect um, people and prevent the spread. And what it really highlighted was um, suppression tactics. And this is really what our governments have been trying to do thus far. Um, and this is the preferred way to deal with COVID right now until at least there can be some kind of vaccination or we have herd immunity. Um, it's a combination of social distancing, home isolation and household quarantine, um, supplemented by school and university closures. Um, there is a challenge to this. Um, it could be another 12 to 15 months before a vaccine is discovered that can be um, mass produced and given to individuals. I know with the current federal administration, the hope is to have that vaccine be enrolled out by January 1st. I really hope we can do that. I think that's an aggressive time frame. Um, but even from now until then, we have we have several months. So we still have to do, deal with the brutal reality that we find ourselves in right now. The article also, about, also talked about suppression tactics being able to be released, relaxed temporarily in short windows of time, but having to reintroduce them when they when case numbers rebound. So it's kind of like the wave that we're talking about. What are we going to do when the situation gets better, but then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a really bad situation again? What tactics are we going to take and how do we take them? There has been so much happening with COVID and there's so much that we don't know right now. And this is um, a slide that I'm really going to call on Sam to, to help us um, talk about this in a little more depth. So I think any one of us can attest to all the changes that we've seen. What's true on a Monday may be completely different on a Wednesday, even on a Tuesday, just depending on, on where, what we're talking about and what we're doing. Um, I know with this disease and this virus, we've talked a lot about it impacting the older population, but there are you know, emerging trends in other subgroups. Um, for young children right now, there's a lot of talk about um, a Kawasaki-like disease. And younger adults um, who are getting this without underlying health conditions are also having some issues. So Sam, did I, I wanted to make sure to give you an opportunity to add to that if you felt that was necessary. Yeah, I mean, it's just, there's growing evidence out there that while this is spread through a respiratory mechanism through droplets and through aerosol, that it's not just impacting your respiratory system. It's, and that's why you're seeing this weird uptick in a Kawasaki-like disease. It's not technically Kawasaki, but it's basically 
same thing, which is a very rare complication that little kids have, and they're seeing it in like usually it happens to like under five, and it's actually happening in slightly older kids too, and it's very rare to see an uptick like this is very strange, um, and it's hitting multiple systems. It's hitting your cardiac system. It's hitting your you know GI system. It, so it's it's a very strange virus that's um, messing around with multiple systems. So we're just learning more every day about this. Um, you know, younger adults having strokes and heart attacks because blood clotting is now being like really digging into it in terms of normally a flu does not cause your blood to clot. Um, so it's just we're learning more and more, and it's a very strange virus that we can't always predict very well in terms of how well you'll do if you catch it as a like if I 32 year old young adult with no underlying health conditions, I can't guarantee that I'll be fine. So we're learning more every day about it. Thank you, Sam. So there's recently we heard Governor Waltz, um, we're now under, instead of stay home, it's stay safe. Um, Non-critical businesses were allowed to open um, recently. They needed to have a social distancing plan and operating at 50% capacity. Um, June 1st, we know that bars, restaurants, salons um, are going to be able to open and the state is still developing some guidance around those um, sectors. And um, Governor Waltz has to balance the economy, which I know is a really pressing matter right now. When you look at budget projections, unemployment, there's just a lot happening that he has to balance um, with all the staying safe and staying at home orders. Um, and he's also acknowledged the possibility of turning the dial back down as needed. Um, I think something that we want to keep in mind is the CDC has some guidance out there that really before things open up, there should be a two week time frame of numbers consistently going down with positive cases and such. We haven't seen that two weeks yet. Um, so some of this is going against the guidance put out by the CDC. But again, I think it goes um, to state the difficulty of balancing all the other things. So as we move forward, I think there's a couple key questions we we can ask ourselves. I know that the governor is taking into account and he has to the economy and everything that's happening to the economy right now as he's making decisions. And I think it, it's fair for us to think about that as well. Um, so a question I think we can ask ourselves is what economy is gained or lost if our buildings remain closed yet are open by appointment and with spe special precautions taken for appointment only visitors and for our staff who need to meet with those appointment only visitors. Our department heads ready or do we have a plan if our smaller units um, or one one man team, so to speak, become ill or quarantined. Um, quarantine is a long is a long road and so we could potentially have somebody out for two weeks and so if there's only one person who knows how to do payroll or only one person who knows how to file certain benefits for on behalf of veterans how are we going to function if those people are quarantined or not able to work for a while if we open up our buildings um, how do we ensure compliance with social distancing is there good ventilation and I think another key question that we must ask ourselves is once our buildings open, what criteria are we going to use in determining when or if the buildings have to shut down again? Um, when, when this all first started, um, it's hard to go back in time, it was only a couple months ago, but we closed our buildings before the stay home. Um, and so I think it's just okay to ask to look back in time and use that experience as we make future decisions to figure out what it is is the best course of action. And that's my last slide. Trying to find a trying to find a mute button. 
the unmute button. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Are there any any questions? Thank, thank you very much. Amy, are are you connected now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. I can hear you, Amy. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have satellite internet at home, so it is not the most reliable. Okay. Um, this has been very <laughs> this has been very interesting for me to listen to, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to let me know where the courts are at. So I just kind of wanted to update you on what has happened since uh, Judge Martin presented last. Sure. So we met with county administration on May 8th to discuss a proposed date to reopen one of our courtrooms, courtroom B, to the Pacific, to hold, start holding some hearing and what measures needed to be in place. So Pete and Dave were a part of that meeting along with our judges and then we also incorporated uh, Heather Immel and Rod later on. Uh, we assigned courtroom B to be the place to hold our first on-site hearing with parties present in the courthouse and we actually did hold some of those hearings yesterday. They were order for protection hearings and harassment hearings. Um, it went pretty well. I was just going to go over some of the safety precautions that we went over before we did that. So um, we worked with Heather and Rod to get the bailiff assignment in place. Uh, we had two bailiffs on site. One of the bailiffs met the party at the entrance and escorted them to and from the courtroom for the purpose of the hearing and to ensure social distancing was in place. Um, the bailiff in court was responsible for court security and to enforce social distancing. So then after the court hearings, the bailiff wiped down the tables and any additional surfaces that needed disinfecting. We did have masks available at the time um, for parties, if, and we encouraged them to bring masks in if they didn't have them. There was also hand sanitizer at each of the tables. Uh, Heather, or excuse me, it would have been Pete and Sarah, my supervisor, worked to get um, X's on the floor to kind of show people where to sit in the galleys. Up at court administration area, there's currently the yellow tape that cordons off the area where people could normally sit. The jury assembly room was locked, is currently still locked, and we don't intend to allow public access into that. Again, all the chairs and tables in the hallway were placed in other locations, and this is to discourage loitering within the courthouse. Public bathrooms were available on the top floor. These are cleaned daily by our maintenance team. Public water fountains are not available until further notice. We have one conference room available with two separate tables with vinyl chairs that are separated by eight feet. All the other remaining public conference rooms are locked. And our public access computers are currently taped off to allow access. There's eight foot tape placements that are on the floor in front of court administration. So if we could choose to open on June 1st, it would to try to enforce that social distancing. That was kind of a rundown of what we did. I forgot that Sam Lowe was also a part of our discussions and she was very helpful, just making sure we were in compliance. The feedback that we did receive from the people whose hearings we set where they were glad to get these hearings set. These were um, order for protections and our harassment. So stuff for people felt in danger. Um, we were able to get their matters heard. We do have other hearings set for later this week to try to finish out hearing those order for protection and harassment hearings. They'll be staggered. They're at the 1.5 hour increments and we're gonna leave these same safety protocols in place. We are hoping to expand to start hearing some of our criminal matters the week of June 18th or sooner. And we're gonna work to meet with the public defender's office before then. And I intend to reach out to Reese with the county attorney's office just to make sure that those attorneys who are coming in feel safe. Uh, when we sent out notices for those hearings and when we reached out to people, we did go over all the safety protocols we had in place. 
if you guys do intend to open on June 1st, the building, we're actually working on a plan as well with a court. So that was kind of a brief rundown, but I just wondered if you guys had any questions for me. Friends, um, Amy, I, I appreciate the update, Amy. Um, thanks for what you guys are doing. And uh, if you need any support, uh, please ask the administration and and we'll try to get it for you. I, I do have one additional thing that we did as well that you mentioned that, thanks commissioner. Um, we did have a person come in, I, I think it was North Star Glass. They're doing the Isanti County Courthouse. We're working to get glass installed around the witness stands to separate the witness from the court reporter, from the judge, and from my staff. So it isn't the public facing, but it's where they're sitting next to each other. Uh, we got an estimate done for glass on that. I've submitted it to my district administration, and they've said that they could cover half. So what I'm doing is I'm working on a proposal to give back to Dave. And Dave and Pete have been very helpful with setting up the people to come in with North Star Glass and also working with us to get those estimates done to keep the public safe when they come into the courtrooms and courthouse. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Amy. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. I guess the, the main exercise here is to just be sure commissioners are all updated on the current status of what the county is doing and then have an opportunity to weigh in and give some direction. Uh, when we did uh, close the courthouse, that resolution did give a delegation of authority to the board chair and the administrator uh, to make decisions on reopening. Uh, back then, we did not know how things were going to play out. And so it does seem like we have some time. Uh, and I certainly want to be sure to get some input uh, from commissioners uh, with regards to the delivery of services. And if I could make just a couple of points, I think Amy brought out the concept that the governor has been reviewing when he puts, you know, he talks about his dials. And if you've watched his presentations and you see the slides, those dials go from highly controlled environments to less controlled environments to uncontrolled environments. And you see what the courts have done is they have started off with a highly controlled environment where only the people that they want in the courtroom are in the courtroom and they have the controls in place to make sure that people follow the rules. And of course, when you're a judge in your courtroom, it's probably one of the most highly controlled environments any of us uh, will go to because the judge gets to make a lot of the rules. But that's kind of a model for how to ramp up services. The county, since this began, has been very focused on ensuring that critical and necessary services have been delivered. So when we talk about opening the county, it's not only about allowing access to service because service delivery has continued. And Becky um, shared a slide and I wanna share um, a sheet that I have that has some just thoughts about as we think about opening uh, facilities, we want to I assume you're all looking at the one through six, although six seems to be double numbered. Um, the things that we'd wanna consider are, what are the executive orders and the state requirements regarding public assemblies? So today we know that we can have assemblies of 10 or fewer with controls. So that's distancing, uh, barriers, masks, et cetera. We wanna be sure that any decision we make uh, for the public follows, uh, MDH and CDC recommendations and anything we have our employees doing also has to follow OSHA regulations and guidelines. And then number three uh, is the needs of the public for in-person services. And we have found that most services that we found a lot of services that can be delivered remotely and not in person, which may be different uh, if you're the customer, it, may, it might not be how you would prefer to have it but it is a way that that service can be delivered. And then for in-person services, we're still exercising uh, protection 
which includes the use of masks and barriers. Uh, and then for HHS in particular, we have some waivers for services. And I know there's been a little bit of confusion. Some of it I have been uh, the cause of on when the waivers expire. And so Becky has clarified that the waivers come from different sources. And so depending on where, where the waiver comes from, the uh, termination of that waiver may vary. And so as a rule of thumb, the waivers that the Department of Human Services have issued to HHS will expire with the governor's uh, peacetime emergency unless extended by the legislature. Other waivers by the Department of Health for WIC uh, will continue potentially beyond that uh, emergency declaration. Uh, and then this gets to number five gets to the control piece, the ability to regulate the number of visitors and maintain best, best practices. Uh, and then also the idea that we can do a phased reopening versus it's an all or nothing approach. So if any of those points are helpful, um, I guess I, today we'd just like to get some feedback from commissioners on expectations and direction uh, for county facilities. And then you also uh, can maybe think about your county board meetings and how if the governor's order, uh, excuse me, peacetime emergency expires on the 12th of June, uh, when and how you'd like to think about phasing in-person meetings back into your uh, schedule. Um, I got some thoughts, but I'll, I'll defer to the rest of the board. Um, if you got questions right off the bat. Well, here, here's, uh, I've been involved with these meetings uh, that, that the staff has had and um, the direction I think we are, are heading down is on June, June 1st is a Monday um, that we would, and I think we, we talked about is, is the Friday before that or the Thursday afternoon or that a kind of a soft opening, but we we do have um, services continuing, but I, there are a certain population that are going to think that because they can go to a restaurant or wherever on June 1st, that why can't I go get my marriage license and you need to do that in person? And why can't I have my document recorded and I can, instead of leaving it in the box, I wanna go do that. I think we can accomplish those by June 1st without endangering anybody's life. I think we've got people that have been working either from home or, or in an office and, and I think we can make that happen. Um, I. I think June 2nd is our next board meeting and that is scheduled for Pine City. And my thought would be that we would do that one electronically. And if things are still progressing well, then we uh, would do the second meeting in June in Sandstone. And we have some better opportunity to distance ourselves at, in that room and and maybe maybe we continue meeting in sandstone until um, for a while anyway that's kind of my thoughts um, and then the next other meeting we have is the um, oh Kelly what <laughs> I get confused if it's the what we call that meeting in June. The County Board meeting. of Equalization. <laughs> Board of Equalization. And what are our thoughts on that? Are we thinking we can do that one in person? Because we haven't had very many people in the past. Can we do it in the jury assembly room, so we have more room to spread out. 
So, Mr. Chair, um, my, my, my two cents that I wanted to give or thoughts for you guys to consider is, so currently we have two people that are signed up. And so, yes, that's regular low attendance. Um, however, we currently have about 60 properties that we're in the process of reviewing um, folks that appeal to their township board of appeal that we were unable to work through those appeals because we were unable to um, we were unable to physically review those properties. Um, so depending on how those turn out, we could have very high attendance. Um, we will have um, we will have a better idea of what the number of appointments will be probably by that June 2nd county board meeting. Um, so I guess I, I mean, if you guys make a decision today, great, but uh, maybe don't necessarily feel pressure to make the decision today for that meeting, um, just because we're, we'll have more information to June 2nd. Right, Steve. If there are 25 people, we can just schedule them every 15 minutes till we're done. So, I, I mean, we don't, all 25 aren't going to be in the room at the same time. But I think you're right. Let's wait until June 2nd to make that call. Matt, did you have something? No, I was just going to say, I, I support your first comments. Um, you know, I think the public has an expectation of our public offices. You know, they're paying the freight. And I hear it all the time, you know. So they're gonna they're gonna want to have some contact, and I think we need to be limited though, um, at least enough so we when someone does walk into an office or someone there to answer those questions, because I I'm like you, there's a whole there's a big a large segment of our population that does not email, they don't text message, they want to walk in and get their service in person, and they're paying the taxes so. I think I think we can figure out how to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we got a couple of weeks to figure that out. Mr. Chair? Yes. Just maybe a question for Matt or for any commissioner um, who's getting feedback. Are there particular services or areas that you're hearing about that people are most interested in? Be most interested in getting back to a, a walk-in availability? No, no, I guess I haven't drilled into it. It's just the fact that, you know, they're, it's, it's like this, when we hire for those positions, we're not hired to sit at home and work. You know, and like when we, you know what I'm saying? There, there's offices, they sit in, they have a job, they're there for a phone call. It's more of the theory of the whole market. And some people think old fashioned. They, the, you know, the whole internet thing and all that means nothing. So you just hear those things. How is this happening? What's happening? And, and they have a different expectation than um, a lot of us do. But it's out there. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. I, I, I think we're on a good trajectory to get um, to get enough of our row offices open. That, that's where I think we need to concentrate. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, from what I heard, uh, was it yesterday from Becky, that um, they have a they have a plan that, that they will have fleshed out by June 1st for uh, veteran services. And so I'm comfortable with that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we've reached out to soil and water to see what what they need um but we can we can certainly make sure that's done um you know high, highway has been functioning um uh, quite well um and i think you know occasionally they do have somebody that wants to walk in and get a culvert permit or something and and uh, i think they'll be able to accommodate them by june 1st so um I, I think we're on a on a good path. Yeah, I for your soil and water question, I um they had a discussion at the meeting and it was they don't get a lot of walk in right. other than 
the um, the public that's programmed to go there for the health and human services. That's the bulk of there, and they they haven't they're not programmed to go to the new building yet, and that's still happening. Right. So, Mr. Chair. Yes. Just maybe um, reviewing the VSO plan because I know that's important to a lot of commissioners and constituents. Uh, Mindy has been working. Uh, you know, to maintain contact with veterans and be sure that paperwork is being filed. There's a notification of claim document that has to be fired, uh, filed that then the applicant can follow up uh, after that notice is filed with the actual uh, application for benefits. And so uh, we feel that all of that is happening. And then the, as we phase back in, uh, because some of this paperwork requires a significant amount of work that's really best done in person. Uh, we have found that Mindy is going to be start uh, making appointments with veterans. And so that there wouldn't be just walking in, uh, you know, and saying, hey, I need to, to do this, that, or the other thing. Um, it would be making an appointment so that Mindy could block that off, be sure that there's not other people in the office because we wanna, you know, not have a crowded room uh, to avoid the spread or contamination of other people, and then being able to take that time with that particular veteran to go through their file, get all the paperwork uh, correct and ready to submit, and then doing that um, on an appointment basis. And so with that approach, we think that's probably most effective and protects the veterans from uh, being in an environment where there's a lot of walk-in traffic, uh, as well as protecting staff and getting the job done. And it, 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 I, I can attest to the fact that Mindy has gone above and beyond. I have, I have seen her um, meet a veteran in the parking lot of McDonald's and sign the paper that needed to be signed on the hood of a car. Um, that, that's kind of above and beyond, I think. And um, she understands that. The whole idea of that veteran service office was to be an open, welcoming place to veterans, and they have they have um, endorsed that and have enjoyed the fact that they could come in and have a cup of coffee and shoot the breeze and and maybe do a little business besides, and and she has been able to shift gears and and do. Um, the right thing, uh, and and so I, I have every confidence that between Becky and Barb and Mindy, they will figure it out and uh, serve our veterans uh, well. I, I just want to point out a couple of other things. I see Terry Fawcett's on the call. He was anyway. Are you still there, Terry? Maybe he, I'm here. I don't want to. I don't want to pick on you, Terry. But I know you have you have followed this um, thing and been involved with the state uh, and testified on the county's behalf and your association's behalf. And uh, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to you also for. Um, Kind of taking the bull by the horns and and making probation an integral part of of the whole solution here for the people in Pine County. So, do you have any thoughts? No, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the, the kind comments. Um, I sent out an email this morning. We were on on uh, a conference call. The deputy commissioner and our lobbyists uh, spoke up, and while we didn't get uh, Funding accomplished um, at the end of the session. There is optimism going into the special session. And there was a, uh, the letter hasn't been sent yet, but there's a joint letter between uh, Senator Limmer, Senator Latz, and then uh, Chair Mariani um, uh, in support of, of the funding. So I think there's some good momentum in the right direction. Um, everybody understands that during the COVID time that the budgets are are tough and nobody planned for this, but um, you know, ultimately people got to be, you know, some of the good things I've heard and 
during the day that I testified from legislators were, you know, you can pay now or pay later, and that's not just economics, that's, you know, with, with staff and resources in the community. If you don't fund the community supervision, then even more burden falls on the prisons, which are overtaxed with staff and COVID issues as it is. And so, um, hopefully we continue to build that momentum and we get something done here for the the good of all of our communities and so that doesn't fall on the counties. So um, we'll continue to do my part. I'm the president until the end of June. So at least I have a, I'll still be on the executive board for another year, but I'll, I'll have uh, still a, hopefully a, a, a good voice here for another month or so. So thank you. Thank you. I think we're okay to move on. Mr. Chair, if I could just summarize then, so we're all clear. So our plan will be to have the courthouse open uh, June 1st for walk-in public traffic. Uh, employees who can work from home will continue to work from home. And the North Pine Government Center will do by appointment only with a focus on the veterans. And I have had some uh, communication with the city of Pine City with regard to when they would want access to their city hall. And so we'll continue to have that conversation uh, and potentially uh, be sure that we accommodate their needs with opening uh, the building to walk in traffic. And then uh, if we have to potentially uh, limit that to the main floor, we can certainly do that uh, since HHS still is operating with those waivers and that seems to be working uh, along with appointments as necessary for HHS. Thank you. People must think this meeting was going to get done at 1130. So it's <laughs> my phone is buzzing. Anyway. Uh, yes, David, I think you're spot on on the, on the recap. So let's move on to Commissioner updates. Namadji one watershed, one plan. Matt, Matt, you're muted. The Magi was canceled for May, scheduled for June, but our plan is basically done. We're just kind of going to put some finishing touches on that. All right, thanks. Uh, East Central Solid Waste, uh, we did have a meeting. Uh, we're just plugging along. There is a tremendous amount of waste that has come in um, when people have been uh, staying home more. They've seen the, the volume from the same amount of households uh, has increased tremendously. And uh, I think I can understand that. Regional Library, Josh. Yeah, we did have a meeting. Um, they're working on the new library in Cambridge is done. That's where headquarters is going to move. Um, they're having some problems getting furniture and some other stuff, uh, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, they're, they're scheduled, I think, hopefully sometime in, in June, they're going to try to get in there. Um, I think I got an email and almost every branch is available for curbside pickup um, or will be here shortly. There was like one or two that was still um, not doing it. They, they were trying to get some, some stuff figured out to do it. Um, but I think as early as this week, maybe next week, every branch should be available for curbside delivery. Um, and it sounds like that's going over really, really well. They're getting a lot of participation in it. So um, they're doing a ton of online uh, library cards and uh, um, just it's been it's been going pretty decent. They shifted a lot of funding over to uh, digital materials and that's kind of a fluid thing we've been doing a lot of with the library but um, obviously in this state um, of, of what we're doing and dealing with electronic materials or digital stuff is the big um, trend. So they've been focusing a lot of uh, purchases on that. They did receive some grants to purchase even more and or um, 
there was some stuff that they let the money up, um, not as restrictive to use it on digital. It was supposed to be used for something else, which I don't quote me. I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, that obviously isn't going to work in this uh, um, pandemic. So they unrestricted it to use it on digital materials. So um, as far as that goes, they were looking at some plans to maybe start reopening too, but I think we got another meeting coming up here. So we'll see how that goes. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Chemical Health Coalition. Yes, I attended that meeting there earlier last week. Um, pretty quiet and quick meeting. Talked a little bit about educational seminars that are coming up yet this summer. Um, also, need some more of these one on one interviews of tobacco use amongst teens. We're working on those yet. Um, then we went over and um, there was talk a little bit, but it's going to be a quiet summer for setting up the booths, for the informational booths at the fairs. Uh, seeing all of those have been put on hold this year, so there won't be much there. Then, other than that, Central was looking at ways to help recognize their graduates. I believe it was last Thursday they received a caps and gown. Uh, then from there, they paraded through the city of Ascob and through the city of Sandstone afterwards to get a little recognition for themselves for for graduating high school because they got a little short change like all the other graduates this year. So that was about it for that. Thanks. So, oh, um, John, I, I read they, they passed the 21 tobacco bill at the state. So did they talk about you know, we had that kind of lined up for the county. It kind of seems would be um, redundant. Yeah, I think it's here to sit back and uh, let it go now. Because okay, all right. <clears throat> Soil and Water Conservation District. Yes, we had a meeting on uh, May thirteenth, uh, and then uh, I'll back up to like you're saying, opening. I think Dave reached out to them and put. Uh, them in the driver's seat and how opening when they're comfortable and let them make their decision on that too. I, I think okay. that was correct. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. So, the tree program was um, crazy this year, sold out, went really well, better than it's ever done. Their drill um, has done 500 or 400, excuse me, 400 acres, and there's a long waiting list for their drill. Um, and it was pretty much a, a general meeting after that with uh, their business. But um, the interesting thing, or I don't know if it's interesting, but their, their water tech um, resigned. Um, they're going to be resigning as of May 22nd. And she took a job with Douglas County, Wisconsin. So what I wanted to just bring up is I know we talked about it in the past. You know, we, we had, I think, a couple different times about bringing the water plant back into the county. and. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out to the rest of the board because now is a good a time as any if you want to think about that or if you want to. Um, I don't. I'm not saying we have that discussion just spontaneous now, but maybe by the next board meeting, maybe we can. If everybody thinks about it. We can decide we want to do that. And just for the background on that, I think. I think we we pass through it's like. Thirteen thousand five hundred or fourteen thousand dollars, which we match. I'm not sure the exact number, but it runs. I think it comes up to about somewhere between twenty six and twenty eight thousand that we put into that program right now. And I don't know. It's it's just it's just a time to talk. I don't know what I don't know. I'm not trying to sabotage anything. I just I know we've talked about it before, so I thought I better come back and let you guys know what's going on there. But with with the um, one watershed one plan thing that's going to be developing in the county, I think we're going to have a lot more interaction at the county level also. And I think Steve, what do you think about that? Now, Mr. Chair, I don't know. It's just, I think it's worth a discussion. Yes, I, I, I think we should have the discussion. 
I, I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how it's going to all play out, but we are we are nearing the point when we're going to have at least two, possibly three water plant or one watershed, one plan districts done. Yeah, we're going to end up with four, but we're going to have a couple of them done here real soon. Oh yeah, we're we're just waiting for the public hearing process to be over, and our plan, your plan is done. Um, Josh Snake Rivers, you know they've they've kind of been doing it for twenty years. So, I mean, I think they got to they got to organize the way they're going to organize. But I think we're we're close. I mean. I don't know. I think I, know, I, I think I pretty just, soon we got all the water covered in Pine County. <laughs> I have no idea how to speak to the the what level we're gonna of interplay we're gonna have in those programs. And I think we'd have to have somebody like Caleb and Kelly and everybody. And we may have to just have a quick committee of the yep. whole meeting or something. I don't know. But yeah, I think you're right. Mr. Chair? Yes. I could just add a couple of thoughts on um, that discussion with the water plan and, and how we want to do our water planning. I think there's general agreement that as the one watershed, one plans come into play, the single comprehensive countywide water plan is going to go away. And in January, I believe it was January, we applied to Bowser for an extension of our current water plan so that we don't have to update it. And so I think we may have the last water comprehensive water plan that we're ever going to have and because of the one watershed one plans so it's it certainly seems opportune to have a conversation or about what how do we want to do water planning going forward i think in the past when we've had these conversations um the swcd probably rightly has gotten about the funding aspect and so maybe as we do it this time, we need to start thinking about the SWCD funding as a separate piece, right? There is some money that attaches to the water plan, but we, we maybe would be, maybe we should start thinking about how should the SWCD be funded? We know there's been some efforts at the legislature to get levy authority. The county board has given some uh, support of those efforts. Uh, this session, they appear not to be successful. It doesn't, I'm not hearing that it's going to be a special session item. So that seems to be dead for this session, uh, which means that we're going to have at least a year or two more of county funding for the SWCD anyways. Uh, so maybe just having that conversation separate from the actual planning would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. I would like, I forgot to add probably the most important part of the water plan. Um, I think I'm going from memory here, but the, the state statute says the county is responsible for the water plan. Right. And then even if we delegate it off like we have to the SWCD, it's still our responsibility to make sure it's being taken care of. We don't relinquish our responsibility by having somebody else do our water plan. So that's why it's another important part of the what we're going to do so i learned that i learned that lesson of responsibility of of duty in basic training or mm -hmm. infantry school when i yeah. got a buddy to take my guard duty and he forgot <laughs> to show up but my name was on the list <laughs> i was still responsible so mr chair if i can just chime in um, we did have a supervisor training several years ago that really drove home that exact point that you can delegate authority, you cannot delegate responsibility. And I think that has been a, a mantra that we have tried to maintain. And I don't think it was coincidental that our instructor was a former uh, naval officer, because I think that is a military uh, concept that has a lot of applicability. Yep. Uh, we'll move on. Lakes and Pines, we had a meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, they're doing some some very, very great work right now um, with food distribution. Becky um, uh, has worked with them and reached out with uh, uh, 
uh, Mille Lacs band who has gone through some um, really tough times right now with their casinos being shut down and and with food support. And so I uh, appreciate the work, Becky, and um, appreciate what Lakes and Pines has done also. Um, and then uh, AMC Blue Ribbon, I, I got appointed to that meeting and, and really what it's all about is kind of the same thing. I think we talked about it once already uh, as we're doing in the county is trying to come up with lessons learned and how we can um, come out of this thing uh, being more efficient and better. And one of the big things we've uh, appreciated about this are the waivers that were granted for a lot of public health, health and human services areas. And um, I believe Hennepin County had identified 45 different waivers that, that they've been able to um, have uh, and work with. Uh, we were very disappointed that the legislation, legislative session ended with apparently no extension of those waivers, except maybe some federal waivers that um, will help us in WIC and buy us another uh, amount of time. But um, I am hoping tomorrow I will find out that they have hooked up a special deal to extend some of these waivers when they come back June 12th or before that. And I, I don't know, but it just seems like there, it is such a no brainer to, to be able to work with, with the waivers without endangering anybody's mm -hmm. well being. And some of the waivers are, are just the way we operate business nowadays. The, the electronic signature thing, the, being able to check on people using electronic devices instead of look uh, meeting them and look staring them in the face. They've been able to, uh, people have told me that they're able to, instead of checking on people once a month, checking on them once a week, which is so much more uh, efficient and better for everybody. And so um, we are all, I think, disappointed in that news, and hopefully, um, we can we can make it better in the end. Mr. Chair, yes, we've circled a little bit back to the uh, COVID response with the waiver piece, and there was one comment I forgot to make, and that is, uh, the county board had waived penalties for property taxes uh, yes. paid late. And so Kelly has some preliminary data that she can share uh, if you're interested in seeing kind of where we I am, stand. I am very interested in hearing that, Kelly. All right, so I am trying to get it brought up here. You guys see the, the table? I see your screen, screen. looks blank. Oh. Let's see. Maybe I'm going to try to take it. You see your cursor moving around. There we go. Okay, super. So can you see the whole table now? Yep. Okay. So this shows you a comparison of where we're at as of end of business day yesterday um, from this year to 2019 to 2018. So you can see um, based on what the total levies are, um, where as of end of day yesterday, we're at 52.3% collected, um, which is down from the previous years. Um, one caveat that I think is, is skewing that a little bit is just the timing of May 15th. Um, May 15th was on a Friday. And so then we had, we only had one business day after that to put in any payments that were mailed. Oh, where like last year, May 15th was, a, we had a lot more time um, to get payments entered. Um, so as of right now, we're at 52.3% collected. Um, I'm gonna pull these numbers again um, and include them. Dave will have them in the Friday update so that you can kind of, you can get a better picture of where we're actually comparing. Um, yesterday, we had a huge amount of mail that came in 
Um, and so I think that we're probably going to end up trending pretty much right on target where we have been from previous years for collections. Um, I do know, though, from hearing from some business owners that they are taking advantage of, of the penalty waiver, um, those businesses that have been really hard hit. Um, but for the most part, it's not going to have a huge financial impact. Thank, thank you, Kelly. That's that's makes me feel a lot much better. Super. Now I got to figure out to stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, before you adjourn, I do have uh, other when you get to that. So. Okay. I do have one more meeting I'm going to report on, and that's the Central Minnesota Council on Aging. We met. Um, we met and had a, a meeting that um, we needed to. It was a continuation of a meeting that uh, had gone on uh, a couple weeks ago, and it had to do with the numbers of meals that the Malax band had requested. And so then we came back and and with some really good work from from the department uh, through the governor's office, through AMC, through Becky. Um, we we got we got the request kind of narrowed down a little bit. Uh, we still had one person on that board, and that's fine that that voted against it. But um, the the sheer numbers of meals that Catholic Charities has provided in the last two months, the numbers to, in my mind are astronomical. They went from an average month of 26,000 meals to uh, at one month they had 93,000 meals. It looks like they're going to settle in at about 73,000. We go from 26,000 to 73,000. That, that's a tremendous increase. So they're working hard trying to trying to get these meals out the door and get them delivered. These are home delivered meals. So, and they, a lot of them, what they, what they've done is gone to these frozen meals. So they prepare these meals, they get them boxed up and packaged up, deliver them to Aunt Susie, who then can put them in the freezer and have, I think there's 14 days of meals there or 10 days or whatever. So anyway, it's a, it's a great program. Uh, they're, they're really targeting the most nutritionally efficient people in central Minnesota. So the people that are not able to get food any other way, basically due to what, whatever reason. So that's it, Matt, you had something else. I do. I do. So this is going to be in reference to. Our land committee and our public land. Um, yep. A month or so ago, I had a communication from Greg, um, our county forester, and he ran across another. The, the general purpose of this is I, I know I reached out to you guys sometime in the past about have, coming up with a deer stand ordinance or something. Yeah, thank you, David, yep. for the picture. But uh, um, so anyway, he ran across this, and this this is a piece of county property. And we, we do not have a deer stand ordinance mm -hmm. and we, and we really do not have of, Hey, what can you do on our public land? So. There's a lot of people today that have, you know, bobcats, you know, skitsters or whatever, and they build stands and they, they just make roads and clear lanes. So. Um, I'm, I'm mostly making this comment because we're working on this right now in our land committee, but I want to get a public kind of a public notice out there that. This kind of activity with, you know, where you come in and just plow a road to your deer stand and state claim to a piece of public property as your own hunting spot is that's not what we look for. We want people to hunt on on our land. We we that was that they're more than welcome, but um, we we need to establish some kind of rule for what they can do to the landscape, and then I think some kind of rule of how big they can build a, a deer stand. And we have. Lots of pictures of these that are much better shape than this one and a lot bigger. And they're like a cabin on stilts that are out there. So anyway, 
I just want to put I, that in all the commissioners' radars. So we're working on something like that, but we want people to hunt here and, and I don't know. Yes, that's it. I, that's, that's not acceptable on public land. Especially the road thing. Holy yeah. people. I don't know who would think that was a good idea. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Chair. Yes. So isn't there some kind of rule or law or something on state land? Um, could we just simply adopt something like that? Because I didn't think I, you could put per, per permanent stands on state land and or obviously alter the, the ground or something like that. So if it would be something we just simply married that policy or ordinance or whatever up to ours, I think that that makes the most sense. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I have reached out to the local conservation officers and I have um, received copies of those, or at least the statute numbers, not the statutes themselves. And I've relayed them to our committee people. So we'll have that those in front of us when we do look at this. And there are different things at the state because they have wildlife management areas that have a different set of rules than state forests, but they do not allow permanent enclosed structures they just allow platforms at six foot I don't know, i'm going from every a small platform at six foot or something but we'll figure it out <clears throat> okay thank you anything else come before the board mr chair mr yes. chair yes. yeah i don't i i i need to back up here a quite a ways i've been trying to interject i don't know if you guys have a hard time hearing me or what but um I really had a one one question on soil and water and the, and the, the water plan, and maybe oh, yeah. it's a question for maybe it's a question for for Matt. I don't know, but I guess I'm just curious what role soil and water has in the one watershed one plan. And as we move forward, that's you know I understand that's going to kind of to plan our water plans. So what role will soil and water for that going forward? You guys that are on those, maybe you can answer that for me. Here, I'll take my stab at it, Steve. I think, I think the role soil and water is gonna take is the implementation. When, when the one watershed, one plan board says, we need to get to the source point of of the phosphorus going into the Snake River, then if if it's pointed at a feedlot or or a whatever in Pine County, then Pine County Soil and Water will work on a plan to help uh, mitigate that. That'd be one no. way. That... So no, they would can still I... be the bad. Pardon me. Can I? Can I? They would still be the bad guys then. Well, no, they're they're kind of the good guys because they they're the guys, you know, the 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 one watershed one plan board would would probably be the people that said this needs to be cleaned up. And and so and a lot of these are not controversial things. They're the farm has changed hands. There's one in Pine City Township. The, the farm has changed hands twice now from a dairy operation to uh, just a, a farmstead. Everybody wants it cleaned up. So soil and water is trying to get the funds to um, help clean it up. So they in that case, they would be the good guys for the new landowners and for the environment. Okay, Mr. Chair, okay. can I say something? Yep, yep, go ahead, Josh. Sorry, I had to step and grab a phone call real quick, but um, from what I understood is, is you're trying to figure out, you know, who's the bad guy, who's not the bad guy, who's, who's here to help. Well, Snake River Management, or Snake River Watershed Management Board right now currently operates on a one watershed, one plan. It, it's essentially the same thing. We've been doing it for 20 years. N nobody is per se the bad guy. So you have a, a impaired area, you have a, there's like different levels of, of, 
of priorities on these watersheds. So what they do is, is if you're in a impaired and you're right on the river or or whatever, you're at a higher priority, you have a better chance of getting funded. All it is is a funding stream. With one watershed, one plan, the, the, the money is substantially more than what we've ever had. So what it's gonna give things like soil and water or the, the one watershed, one plan uh, um, team is to go in there and say, uh, hey, Mr. Farmer or Mr. You know, I have a junkyard right on the river. You, you're not going in there giving them a citation. Um, you're not going in there telling them they can't operate. You're going in there with hopefully some solutions that most landowners are willing to, to comply with. Some are not, some are. There's a, sometimes, depending on the level, depending on how bad they want it cleaned up, there's some buy-in on the, on the landowner. Um, sometimes there's not. I know we've done some where we really wanted this done in the worst way, so we funded the whole thing. And all this is going to do is give a lot more tools and a lot better um, response and a lot better. I mean, money is the object where, you know, everybody wants to do, most people want to do the right thing. Water is important, but it all comes down to money. Um, you know, so with the state funding this at very high level, it should help a lot. You know, if you go in there and say, hey, Steve, you got to clean up your your feedlot, it's going to cost a hundred grand. Yeah, we'll throw 10 grand at it. You're going to say, yeah, right. See you, bye. If you go in there and say, hey, we really want to improve the water. Um, let's do this, 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 and this. Um, it, it might be better better for your cattle or your livestock. It might be better for the water, the environment, everything. And hey, we really want this done. You're a willing, great landowner. We're going to fund the whole thing. Well, great, perfect, let's move on. And or you got to buy in five grand or you got to just- hear about five minutes, Dennis. I got, you got to take where I'm responsibility. Here. So it should be a good thing. Go on. So do you think I ask you a question? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it, yep, go ahead. In, in the one year over there, yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So yep. if if you're one one watershed, one plant over there, if they if they see that there's a, there's something that needs to be whatever, you know, be a feedlot, whatever it might be, so then do they draw up a plan and they say, Look, soil and water, we want you to do this or do that? And, it, and yeah. it's not and necessarily they... always soil and water. It, it might be um, environmental resources or land, okay. you know, it might be the land okay. end of the county. It might be such okay. and such. So, it might be the, the landowner reaching out to somebody saying, hey, yep. I heard there's money available. You know, my fence is junk that's along the river. Can you help me fix the fence? You know, um, so it could be a cattle crop, you know, whatever. Do they? Do they appropriate money then for an entity to do that? So yeah. you create a budget and then, you know, you you kind of have certain things, but I know ours, we've got grants before um, and you you have, you, you modify it as it needs to be or amend it, however you want to say that. Um, if, if you find a willing landowner, that's not necessarily a high priority. So your funding stream is a little different. We talked to Bowser about uh, modifying that, they approve it, and then we move forward, you know, so. Okay, so there is funding, there would be funding that would go, to, let's say like soil or water to do what they would need to do? Yep, yep, yep. definitely. Okay, that's, that's what I was trying to get at. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Yep. You bet. Anything else? Well, I think we set the record for the longest um, video Lang County meeting ever. So I don't know if that's something to be proud of, but <laughs> we made it. If there's no other business, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll uh, call the meeting adjourned. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Chair Holland.